is Richard Holliday. And Richard Holliday is the stone carver down on Commercial Road. Grey's Wharf. Grey's Wharf. Um, so he's putting on a show for us uh, in Penryn Week. We thought it was a good idea to link it in with Penryn Week. Um, he was a little bit nervy about it, but I persuaded him to do it on the basis so we can do it down there. So he doesn't have to come up to some, you know, uh, sort of location like this and sort of present. He can do it on his own turf down in uh, down the Grey's Wharf. So it's a free show. Um, but we just do need names, if, you know, if any of you would like to come, we do need names because it's just sort of limited seating, really. You know, we can take up to 20. So, uh, I've given Arms Alive members the first opportunity, first come to serve. So, you know, if anyone else would like to attend, if they'd like to put their name and phone number on the back, you know, that'd be fine. Yeah. I think you should be eating some of these guys. I thought it was just going to be so. By the way, I've just mentioned, I've just mentioned, I'm the, the work that he does down there. I must admit, I hadn't seen much of it, you know, um, I've sort of only been in there twice. First time I did really, you know, look too closely, but this time I did look a little bit closer. And it's just fantastic. He's doing, he's got one in there, it's, it's um, shallow relief carving. It's fantastic. And it's uh, an Eskimo and a hoodie. And I mean, it's just so cool because he's called it Inuit in it. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I just think that's so cool and not true. Anyway, I'll leave it on the side if anyone's interested. Well, it's 7.30 and it's Thursday the 19th of July. So that grows So if you're interested, if you want to put your name in, you can book a seat. No, no, no cost, it's just sort of, you know, drop 50 quid in pop or something, you know. It covers all forms of art, any form of art, basically. It's just the arts. Um, we, we're kind of relying on people who know they're more confident in what they're doing and to manage it themselves to some degree. We'll give them the backing and where, where venues are needed. We'll, we'll try our best to get that done. But it'd be nice to just some degree of self sufficiency as well. Um, we haven't really formed any hardcore philosophy or anything yet, except it's a fairly free, free thinking thing. Um, we've decided we will reach out to our parts of the universe to drag people in. Um, at the moment, it's open. Um, anyone who's got any ideas, more than welcome, Michelle. Um, <laughs> So that's that's the bones bit. I'll get my number out and um, ring me or email me, and we'll meet up and. Yeah, the next meeting is on the fourth. Uh, uh, two weeks today. Two weeks today. Ten o'clock. School of noises, noises. Not at the same time, but in the same day as the school of noises. Um, and everybody would be doing it in the town hall. Yeah. And also the same it seems we may, I mean, that matter of the council, we may actually have a centre for it as well. Ooh. So it'll actually have a base, which I think is essential. We've worked with Brighton Festival for some years. Um, you can't, this can't just be sort of a home run, um, fun with everyone up thing. It's got to be fairly strongly organised. So. We're not organised, it's got to be fairly tight, it's got to be fairly professional. Very professional. Yeah. <laughs> Alright. Hey. 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 Hey.
Joseph Lusian from the age of 14. Um, he moved to Madrid where he studied with Anton Bacarmendis, a painter who was popular with the Spanish uh, royalty. Um, he wasn't very happy with Mengis. He found um, he, he quarreled with frequently with his master, failed his exams. Um, tried entry to the Royal Academy of Fine Art in 1763 and 1766 and failed. So he wasn't, he wasn't very happy at that time. So um, he went to Rome uh, in, in, um, in 1771. He decided you know, to leave Madrid and just go and travel a bit. Um, whilst he was in Rome, um, he visited the churches and um, found the, um, the Rococo and the uh, Baroque uh, paintings there, uh, more to his taste. So um, when he returned to Zaragoza later that year, he painted parts of the, of the capital, I'm losing it, okay. He painted parts of the capital, capitalists of the Basilica of Pula. And uh, these were painted very, uh, very much in the deck, deck of Baroque and Rococo styles. So I'll just, I have got. Um, he uh, 
Over the course of five years, he designed some 42 patterns showing a distinct Rococo style. Um, I remember this work to be last because Spain at that time, um, as the possibly the whole of Europe was um, at war with somebody. So the, um, the, the coffers of the um, king uh, were getting a little empty. So he, uh, the, 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 the royal tapestry, um, tapestry um, factory was closed. So he needed to, um, to, so, uh, to cut, cut to his lack of work, he returned to the neoclassical painting of the church subjects, but not losing his individual touch. Through his work, he was awarded the position of Academic of San Fernando. Um, and he wrote, you know, So anyway, I'll read this, um, what he wrote uh, in a report of the Academy of San Fernando. There are no rules in painting, and um, the oppression or servile obligation of making all study or follow the same path is a great impediment of the young, who profess this very difficult art that approaches the divine more than others. He goes on to condemn the practice, practice of using casts as drawing practice instead of attending to nature, the work of God. And I, I, if there are any paint, I know there are painters here. I think you, uh, sort of, you can sort of uh, agree with, <laughs> with that statement. Anyway, um, so on this. In 1786, he was appointed painter to King Charles III, um, or Carlos III, he should be called, really. He was, he was uh, 40, um, and um, he was 40 when he was appointed. Um, now, King Charles believed um, and promoted enlightened absolution I'm sure you want to know what that means. Um, he, he held that royal power emerged not from divine right, but from social contract, whereby the ruler has a duty to govern wisely. Um, um, Charles III died in 1788, and Charles IV then came to the throne. And um, although he believed in the sanctity of his office, he took very little part in the actual administration of the country, leaving that to his wife, Queen Maria. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, but she replaced she replaced the Prime Minister with a favourite and alleged lover, mm -hmm. who was um, Manuel de Gobe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Royal family, and I hope that yeah. Well, I put this up a few days ago. Um, yeah. But before we go to that, actually, in 1792, Boris suffered the serious illness which is of the temporary para paralysis, paralysis, sorry, partial blindness, which he recovered from, but became permanently deaf. After this experience, his painting techniques changed to glorious type of style. Now this is Charles the, the fourth of Spain and his family. And um, I think you would agree that it's, um, it's realist, it's direct, and also critical. Uh, no attempt to flatter. Um, well, he, got, he, he gets away with it, actually, because he's 
so popular at that time. Um, this is seen today as a satire um, by re revealing the corruption present under Charles the Fourth. Um, Louisa, his wife, is placed right in the middle. Um, and as I said before, she was the one with real power. Interestingly, he's painted that one for two babies away from the, um, the, yeah. the queen. Yes. Um, actually facing the other side of it. Yes, yeah. Profile, you know, you can hardly see it. Yeah, yeah. You see this character here in blue? Yeah. That's Ferdinand. He's the crown prince. He comes into the story later. Identity emerged as a continent. Also, became the divide, becoming the divide between Christian and Muslim countries. Uh, but so, a group of nations having superior technical skills and sharing historical experiences. Um, there's a definition in the Collins Precise uh, Directory Dictionary, so uh, if I spirit edition. Uh, forming the western extension of Eurasia, Eurasia, the border with Asia runs from the Euros to the Caspian and the Black Seas. Um, began in 1789 um, and then oh, the we can just go back and yeah. go back to the Six 
62, I think. Sorry, who is 62? Doyle. Doyle 62. Um, Napoleon's brother, uh, Joseph Bonaparte, is a story on the Spanish door. Now, um, Gloria didn't leave, neither did a lot of the intelligentsia, because they had been watching what had been happening in France with great interest, um, probably possibly approving. Um, but um, so they stayed around to see what would happen. I think Gloria was one of those um, who thought, well, um, let's see, let's see what happens. However, the Spanish population uh, of ordinary people objected greatly to France invading them, and they put up a lot of resistance. And um, and um, there was an uprising in Madrid. So, sorry, why in fact did they object to France or was it that they appeared to be there? Well, they were invaded. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it just messed up that I was a lot. It just messed up that I was a lot. 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 I was a Countryside. Can I explain that makes sense now? Yeah. So, was it an organised, an organised, you know, loyalist resistance? Then? No, no, it was, it was just all uprising, right. really. So, he, uh, essentially, Charles, then Charles just gave up. And didn't well, he Charles was then? just taken to France. He just, oh, right. he just disappeared into into France. The whole family were um, were taken away. Oh, okay. So, um, to, uh, as I say, Joseph Bonaparte was his daughter. Um, for the past brother, yeah. was installed as the um, as a king, as the on the Spanish throne. So Goya cooperated. Um, he did paintings of the uh, of Joseph's family of you know the the, the French, uh, but he was abhorred by the French of, of atrocities, and there were uh, quite a lot. Um, so, um, yes, um, sorry. Just so, did he agree with them, you know, ideologically? Ideologically, he was, ideologically, yeah, actually, let's go back to the Enlightenment. So I sort of got that rather. Um, the political structure of Europe is about to change radically. There is a period of greater advance in political thinking, as the ascending cultural creativity, intellectuals, and scientists of the 18th century described their activities as the Enlightenment. Their purpose was to break from the past, which they saw as steeped in obscurity, darkness, and ignorance, and to bring the light of truth to thought. The seat of power was moving away from the aristocracy to the common people. Uh, I found another statement on that about uh, Enlightenment was a middle class ideology, ideology thought that the freedom of society would pass through capitalism. Um, Um, the populace 
Dimitri uh, rose up against uh, the Mamluks, who were uh, a part of the um, of the French uh, army. Um, they were, um, if you, I don't know how clearly you can see that, but they are. Um, they've got knives, staves um, against. They weren't um, painted during the occupation. Um, in, um, in 1814, Napoleon fell, and the Bourbon monarchy was restored to um, to Spain in in the shape of Ferdinand. I know the mm -hmm. pointed out to you that he was the son of Charles the Fourth. Oh, that's when he painted these, isn't it? Hmm? That's when he painted these after. Afterwards, Afterwards. yes. <laughs> what is it? What is it? What is it? He was reinstated in uh, 1814. 1814? Well, they said 1814, and we've got a copy, right? Sorry. That's okay, that was just for me. Charles I's son did not share the enlightened views of his father and launched a reign of terror. Now he um, he was really quite vicious. Um, Goya was troubled over his, over his loyalty, along with many of the other Spanish Republican liberals. Um, and they were all in danger of jail or worse. And a lot of, um, of the liberals who had stayed behind and cooperated with the French were actually executed. Um, and he and he brought back the Inquisition as well, which um, Goya had um, quarrelled with quite a lot in the past. So he was in a bit of a sticky position. So um, he um, um, yeah, they were produced. These paintings were produced after the reinstatement of the monarch, monarch, monarch sorry. Um, Fernando was no longer of enlightened thinking, turned his back, uh, turned back many of the advances made by his predecessor. He cancelled the constitution. They had actually, uh, um, before Ferdinand came back, they had. Um, tried to put a constitution to run the country, um, but uh, he uh, cancelled that 
and reinstated the powers of the church in the royal absolutism. There was enmity between him and Goya, who at the age of 68 was not interested in capitulating to his changes. The two paintings of the Madrid uprising did not gain royal approval, as they showed the, the patri patriotic heroism of the lower classes, rather than the usual historic paintings of the office, officer class, leading their liberated <coughs> troops into battle. The common people, rising up in the 2nd of May, and the terrible vengeance stands out to them in the 3rd of May, were not to Fernando's taste. He was only interested in his own self development, but did not find the paintings in any of his palaces or acknowledge their existence. They were discovered stored in the basement of the Prado years later. That's from Robert Hughes's uh, book. Now we go to the disasters of war, the etchings. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you these. You are familiar with that one. There were a series of 85 etchings called the disasters of war, produced between 1810 to 1820, but were not published until after his death. They depict the travesty witness during Spain's struggle for independence and of France. This series was never pu published during Goya's lifetime, probably because it is a profound enunciation of war. Get to his last years. Um, well, his last years saw it being isolated more and more um, uh, from political and intellectual life in Madrid. But remember, uh, during all of this, he was actually deaf. He was totally deaf. So his life must have been very, very, very difficult. Anyway, um, getting no royal commissions, he retreated, retreated to Puerto del Sordo, the Death Man's House. Now, um, it was already called the Death Man's House. So um, I don't know whether that was Goya's uh, sense of humor. Or, or, you know, that he actually, that was the house he retired to. But um, there he produced the black painting, pres uh, uh, frescoes of the wall of, of the little house. And I believe that actually they, they were very carefully taken off the walls that are now in the Prado, so they can see. Um, it, completely dissatisfied with political development in Spain. Uh, he finally asked permission from the king, but it was granted uh, to go to Bordeaux, to retire to Bordeaux uh, under the guise of seeking medical advice because he did actually have a, a recurrence of the illness that made him deaf, or he had another serious illness. I don't know whether you could say it was the same a recurrence of the same illness. But anyway, he went to Bordeaux for his, uh, for his last years. And he spent the week quite happily, I think, between uh, Bordeaux and Paris. Not bad. <laughs> 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 right. Well, I thought so. I suppose I should say that in question. Uh, I'm interested in why you didn't say to talk for Goya. Because you could have talked to him and why you didn't you know, say to Goya? Because I wrote my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> so I already knew quite a lot. Okay. I'm so going to go there. Um, anyway, um, we were, uh, we'd started the war, haven't we? 
and he doesn't have ac direct access to that, but he can manipulate it to make it powerful. Do you know what I mean? And not just an just a, yeah. a distant image almost. Do you know what I mean? It's like actually this is what this really means. Yeah. So we adopt it and, and, and contextualize it and bring it back into the discussion. The thing is, have we been on what sort of we have, but apart from the people that actually go out there, have we been desensitized by it all? Because if you watch the news and yes, stuff like that, which I don't think we've been desensitized. I mean, if you look at these images from Syria, when they killed all those kids, I don't think anybody was desensitized by that. Maybe, I mean, that was the were disgusting and people were just yeah. horrified, weren't they? Yeah. I mean, that was so upsetting. I'm not, I'm not upset saying it's not upsetting, but what I'm saying is, is that we see these images constantly on, you know, channel news and stuff like that all the time. But they do it in point of view. I think I see it as an explorer generation thing. I think the war game that people play are the downfall because it's the, the American soldiers. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think it's the viewer to see that happening. Yeah, because they're doing it differently. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also, I think, there's a difference when you're referring back to the talk. Yeah. Because of those, those later images, um, it, it, it was the role of, of documenting, it was the role of that artist, it's also like what a photojournalist is yeah. 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 So, yeah. so the, the context is very different. I think what an artist tries to do now in terms of war it isn't so much to do with being journalists. Yeah. I'm not I'm not criticizing journalists, I'm not pushing one against the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a different different yeah, role. And, yeah. and it's and it's the difficulty with something like war is, is that as soon as it becomes, I suppose, literal in a way, as soon as it's changed something in a certain way, then the idea of it being art is kind of lost. It becomes it gets the realm by the propaganda for whatever yeah. side it is. Okay. And, and I think putting people in a position of I suppose thinking, or seeing, listening, mm -hmm. thinking, rather than being told. Was, I would say to answer your question, well, the part of the role of the artist mm -hmm. work is, 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 to, is to be able to have that kind of distance, I suppose, to and use forms and methods which, um, which for the viewer or the listener, they then have to kind of scrutinise and think rather than mm -hmm. be told. And yeah. Yeah, that's a, yeah. And that's, that's a kind of a difference. Whereas yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know, that, What's the role of the kind of boy? No. Yeah. So the folly of dogs and tea, different to imagination. This question? Is the value of documenting different to imagination? Imagine. Yeah, it's really, really different because, I mean, the, the thing is, if you look at that sort of main picture, mm -hmm. is that as far as I understand the kind of where I've seen a main secret, that, that was the first painting that ever appeared about its head, and that was heralded as the first sort of modern painting. Because it was about the actual viewer and mm -hmm. what they seen in the and it, was, it wasn't to be a pretty picture to be hung in a, a, a palace wall mm -hmm. or created for a particular audience. And that's what made that painting so quite striking in terms of art history. Is that right? Yeah. Was that right? Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and the fact that he painted it because he wanted to paint it and he had the means and the way mm -hmm. to do it and the authority to do it. Yeah. And I mean, I don't have anybody else, I've, I've seen it, has anybody, anybody else seen it? Yeah, yeah. it's quite, as, as a painting, it's now boomed pretty much on its own. It's on one side, it. Yeah, 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 on one side for the, uh, in the cradle, uh, and there might be one other picture in the room. How big is it? Um, probably bigger than the projection yeah. screen. Okay. It's quite big. Yeah. So that, was the first, that was the first sort of documentary type painting? Then. Yeah. You, yeah. Is that what you say? Yes. Well, as far as I understand, as far as I understand. Surely, surely the tradition has already been established if you think about what. Well, no, I no, mean, no, 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 just a yeah. chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to develop the argument, if I may. Yeah, yeah. Do you have this yeah. cut, cut, um, or whatever it is? The, um, just keep it going. Just keep 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 going. Just it's just a matter of a historical reflection, really, because if we think about all the uh, religious images that have been painted up to that time, 
you know, they were, they, if they'd been painted maybe you know, 500 years, 1,000 years prior, they would have been considered as documentary, i.e. Jesus being crucified, etc., etc., you know, uh, and all the, lots of those other really terrible uh, images that, that you can see in some of those very, okay, they were medieval paintings, um, you know, 1500s onwards, whatever. Um, so is it just a, it's just a matter of the amount of time that's elapsed as to whether or not we consider them docu a documentary type painting or whether it's uh, an imagined um, scene that, that, that has come through the scriptures or whatever piece of writing that's then been reimagined by the painter. Yeah, in terms of the it's power, power that painting is imbued by the person that commissioned it. So therefore the church was to call that glorifying God. And yeah. therefore these iconography to, to empower that religion yeah. where, you know, previously the factual paintings were done, but they're always the opposite class. And it's all about being yeah. really the supreme person. Yeah. Yeah. This is sort of saying, you're losing. This is, this, you know, this is, you know, a heart felt cry by a Spanish one saying, this is what it was yeah. like to lose. And people were willing to die for it. Yeah. Which, you know, there's none of the grandeur, you know, in that. You know, the, yeah. you know because the actual material that he used, the paint, yeah. You know, he could have painted it like that, he could have made it with flowers to see and beautiful, yeah. but obviously the actual emotion and how he felt about it was that yeah. he just wanted to make it as painful and as raw as possible yeah. for, for his particular the way that he was painting at that time, mm -hmm. which is what's so shocking about that painting in comparison to paintings that came before and after, is that was really the first mm -hmm. one where he got rid of all this sort of blankness and all this trying to make it work as nice right. as he picked and just gone for the yeah. actual people just being lined up and, you know, and dying for their country. And also the fact that artists were tied into this patronage. You, did, you, you, didn't, yeah, you, exactly. show, you didn't just create work for the sake of creating it, you actually created it because you had somebody you paying you to do it and that, telling you what they wanted and how, how they wanted it. Mm -hmm. And the, the availability for them to have the resources to create something for their own pleasure or for their own taste wasn't really there because he wouldn't have been able to afford those materials or they would have had to be sold in order for them to make money because they wouldn't have wanted to buy that. I don't know what. I think one of the photographers on there was an essay with the FIFA people that there's the, the copyright owned by FIFA, not by the photographers. It was the same then. He, he might have painted it, but actually he had nothing invested in it and he couldn't you know, gain anything by being the painter of it. And it's, it's the same sort of. You know, sort of the artist just got told what to do and they were very skilled at doing what they did. But Goya got to the point where he could actually yeah, he was breaking yeah. away from that. Maybe more yeah, and sold his life and yeah. Once he's on the rest of the money. Yeah. Yeah. Um I thought uh, quite a lot about why actually he stayed. Um I've suggested why he didn't leave when the French fell. Um, he probably didn't have much choice. I don't think he had much choice to stay in Madrid. Um, he did actually con contribute to the war effort once it started the, you know, the fight back started. He gave his canvases for bandages and stuff like that. But um, I thought at, that, at the age of 62, he wasn't going to last and leave and go to a strange country or, or retire somewhere when his, uh, his studio was, you know, he was, uh, they didn't have to do the paint in those days, they had to mix the paint, so his studio would, would be very important to him. But I don't know how anybody else thinks about that. I suppose in France, which is quite relative for as well, you know? So it wouldn't necessarily be next like, oh well I'll go to France, where do you go? So I went to Europe, wasn't it? Well, not still all of Europe. That's what it is, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, but uh, why go, why go, um, you know, you've got your, you're probably in the middle of painting. Yeah, it's probably quite, also really quite interesting to the extent of something. Something that's, that's changing yes. and it's quite exciting. I think. You kind of, you're quite behind, do you know what I mean? If revolution came to ten men, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
yeah. yeah. very difficult to.